I have made videos at many, many football teams on the island of Ireland, from FAI teams like Shamrock Rovers, Bows, Dundalk and UCD, to IFA teams like Linfield, Crusaders, Glentoran and many, many more. None of these clubs would even be around, none of those videos would even be possible if it wasn't for the very first club who set off football in Ireland. Ireland, and that is who we will be investigating today. There was a man who left Ireland on his honeymoon, went to Scotland, saw a game of football, came back and thought, this country needs that sport too. And we will be investigating Cliftonville Football Club in this video. I saw them play yesterday. I'm seeing Glen Torren play today, so my three match day vlogs from Belfast should already be up. Do check them out. Wait till the end. I'll leave some cards on screen so you can click through to them if you haven't seen them before. This should be an absolutely fascinating fascinating video. Let's get out into the city of Belfast and check out Ireland's oldest football club. <laughs> this is where it all began for football in Ireland. My name's David Begley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Clifton F Football Club. And so we're obviously not at solitude right now the home of cliftonville we are just over the road can you explain the significance of the place we are at right now this is the original home of football in ireland and cliftonville football club who are the founders of football in ireland this was cliftonville cricket club um, and initially cliftonville football club played their games here at the cricket club until we moved across the road in 1890 when we started playing football at our our, our home and we've been playing football at our ground solitude ever since. And so obviously this was a cricket ground in, I, get, I take it, the mid to late 1800s. Yes. But it's still being used for sport now by yeah. schools and GAA. The, 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 the cricket club have now moved to another venue and uh, the, the land then became the property of Belfast City Council. And it's now a multi-purpose multi 3G pitch, which used for Gaelic football, which is for football and all sorts of sports here and, and as well as part of the land has also now become a primary school as well, the Bond School, the Irish School um, as well so it's very much part of the, the, the community here. And so could you just explain to everybody who it was who was running the cricket club at the time who then went to Scotland, saw the game of football and thought we need that here? I'm not sure if he was actually running the cricket club but he was heavily involved with Clumble Cricket Club and his name was John McAleary and John uh, the story is little bits of detail missing but uh, that he went to Scotland on his honeymoon while well, he was on his honeymoon in Scotland he took in a football match there loved it so much and when he came back home again uh, he then put an advert in the paper saying does anybody want to play a football join a football club yeah we want to go to play under Scottish football rules and uh, they arranged a training session and it all, all went from there. There's another little story was that he was a big draper, drapery store in, in Belfast that yep. sold uh, cricket equipment and other sporting equipment. Okay. And he saw a commercial opportunity. Okay, yeah, so it makes if sense. So start another sport, I have something else to sell as well. Oh, fair enough. But if it wasn't for him, we would maybe not have been at Crusaders v Cliftonville last night. I obviously saw you there. We Absolutely. might not have been at the League Cup final the day before. So yeah. he's the man we've got to thank for all of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he sold the seeds then uh, Cliftonville went on you know we had to you know we had to help found other clubs so we had opposition to play against yeah 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 um, and then we were instrumental in setting up the Irish Football Association obviously many of the clubs in the Irish League are what you would call Protestant clubs right but this is in a Catholic area of Belfast is it the only one in the Irish league that you'd consider a sort of Catholic club quote I, unquote I, I, I hear pigeonholing people but uh, probably not there might there would be one or two others that would be perceived that way okay but people but people forget Cliftonville was founded by a, a son of a Presbyterian minister and basically was a Presbyterian club in ethos and to this day, we now have you know, we've still club chap. We've two club chaplains who are both Presbyterian ministers. Yeah. Um, what happened in Belfast? You know, it's well documented about the troubles and whatever. <laughs> Obviously, not going to get into all that there. But there was demographic movement. Yeah. 
you know, the, the, this area changed from uh, what would have been perceived as a Protestant Union er area during the Troubles. People mm -hmm. migrated to different areas because of different pressures and that that they were under. And this has became a more predominantly Catholic area. So by the very nature of that happening, at the same time, Cliftonville moved from being an amateur club in the early 1970s, it was 1972, 73. We've been amateur all our lives, we've been a bit of a Cinderella club, but when that move happened and brought professionalism, the team started to do better. Yeah, okay. Which sort of culminated around the 1978-79 period when we actually won the, the Irish Cup yep. for the first time in 70 odd years. And that demographic movement, along with you know the uh, increased support of the club, sort of swung the balance however the club to this day is still mixed from top to bottom see i often and i just said this to you off camera don't like to delve into those issues too much in videos yeah. for obvious reasons especially in scotland where i live yeah, i yeah. feel like it's more accepted to talk about that here in belfast a little bit more but i like how oh we love to i like but i like how this club i like how this club here. is sort of a mixture of the both though yeah. and that shows how football can really bring people together in yeah. my opinion yeah yeah no, well the one thing football does do like it has throughout you know our very troubled history here football kept going yeah people still get going to football games yeah we had our rivalries yeah quite nasty at times but it kept going and it did always bring people together and it gave us an out when you know you couldn't go out at night down belfast or whatever you still could go to your football game on a saturday afternoon amazing and speaking of the football stadium's right up here yeah. let's go So here we are, Solitude now. So you say you've been here since the 1890s, is that right? Yep. Uh, so this part parcel of land was taken in 1888 and uh, they started developing it into a football pitch. Uh, obviously at that time it was basically a cinder track yep. right, right, around, around the pitch, but you know, then they opened it in eight, eight, actually in 1890, but the first thing event that they opened the ground with was not a football match. What was it? With bicycle racing. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. So nice. that you know that, that's what it, it was yeah. the opening event. It was used for athletic meetings um, as well, and uh, but then the football officially started in 1890. And so, what is this building behind us? When I came here last time, I noticed it, and yeah. I'm intrigued to know what it officially, was. Officially, it's called the Pavilion. Okay. But it's affectionately referred to as the White House. <laughs> nice. And uh, because it was painted white. Uh, very much like the f uh, Craven Cottage, Fulham's. It is a little bit similar actually, yeah, in the corner there, but you get a good view from yeah. up at the so top. So that was yeah. the original where the boardroom was, the changing room rooms, and everything happened. And that was built in 1890. It was extended in the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, when it was opened in 1890, it had, had all the state of art, art facilities, including a plunge bath, the wow. old plunge bath yeah. that everybody all piled into um, after, nice. after a game. So that was still in use until about uh, 12, 13 years ago, when there was a new change room complex built as part of a new one of the new stands at, at, at the ground. Yeah. It's still here. It's in a poor state of repair, unfortunately. Uh, we've a lot of vandalism and, uh, and that to it there. It should if be a we, listed building, in my it's opinion. It's not a listed building. If we could find a way of keeping it, if somebody could help us fund it, yeah. we would love to do so. Anyone watching, any sponsors, anything like that, get, out, get Please, on it and help yeah, out. Because yeah. it would be, it's an absolute fanta fantastic thing. But uh, unfortunately at this stage, it, it, it's not part of the future you know, of the club, unless, shame, yeah. unless we can get yep. uh, as some serious money If anyone for watching it. can help, get in touch. Oh yes. So this is the plunge bar from the old days that all those initial players would have used back yeah. in those early days. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, it's a shame to see the status in now, but it's got like a yeah, historic feeling to it, yeah, isn't it? You know, you know, if you think, you know, the international football that was played at the ground, you know, all the international, famous international yeah. players that jumped in the bath here on the way It even there. says CFC along the bottom there as well. You know, you can see around the ground, there's three, three active stands, and on the far side there, you'll see a, a, a grass bank, but originally, Bar a stand here to my left, the entire ground was terracing. Okay. Cool. And there was covered terracing on, on different different parts. And you know, you could have a crowds of 15, 20,000 here where international football uh, well didn't start here. 
it progressed to here through the 1890s and into the, I think about 1910, Ireland played a lot of, or most of their international games here, here at Solitude. Um, the stand here to the left um, it is the third version of a stand that uh, has been in the ground for various reasons. This one was built in the 1950s. Yep. Um, but unfortunately, again, it's coming to the end of its, its lifespan. And again, and I know we don't want to get into too much politics here, but we've been, us like all the clubs, were promised funding from our, our, our uh, Northern Ireland Assembly, who don't seem to ever want to sit down and work together. And so we are suffering as clubs because we desperately need that funding to yep. help us grow football here. Yeah, there seems like there's a few stadiums around the country that need that infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Just sort of improved upon yeah. a little bit. And we didn't get any money in the Taylor report. Everybody else okay. got money on under the Taylor report. What, so England, Wales and Scotland, yeah. but Northern Ireland didn't? We didn't. Right, okay. So we were left the poor relations. So clubs over uh, on the other side of the Irish Sea were able to avail of it. We, we couldn't. So we've been waiting for that investment. Um, and if, if it was first announced back in 2011. Then in 2015, they were ready to push it. And of course, then the assembly collapsed again. And so it keeps going on. So the money on offer back then is no longer worth the same yeah. seven, eight years later. And oh, especially we, over the last one or two years as well. Absolutely, yeah. and this is where we're, we're going, even if that money was released tomorrow, we're going to have a big problem. And so know? what is the hardest part about running a football club in 2023, given the last two, three, four years with the pandemic, cost of living crisis, etc.? We have not, for you know, our admission prices to our ground haven't gone up in, in over those years. So but while our, all our costs are rising, just like everybody, just like at home, mm -hmm. you know, our energy costs, um, our wage costs, everything we purchase, everything we do has gone up, but we've kept the prices up because we recognize that it's very, very difficult for people to afford. However, it's it's 12 pound for an adult ticket into an Irish League game. It's fantastic value. And that game yesterday, money. unbelievable like, Where would value you get that money. for 12 pounds? Exactly, yeah, you know, I know. Last night's game had, had absolutely everything in it, and but that's, what the Irish League is, is about and an Irish League game I, people say to me who do I support in England or Scotland I say I don't support anybody over there why not I says well, supporting a team on TV is not the same f for me after an Irish League game you can actually be in the, the bar afterwards and having a drink yeah. w w with the boys who you were shouting about on, on the pitch of course yeah when you shout abuse at a referee in an Irish League game he hears it uh, yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> you know, so yeah of course that's there these small grounds you can hear everything yeah. that is, is so done. the rest of the ground there has been been developed but you know we and we have ambitions to to reinstate it and get it back up back up to yeah you know that that's that higher higher level game we need it all our home games, our home end this season has been basically sold out for every single home game Amazing. this season. Yeah. We can't grow as a club unless we get more capacity. So that's 1943, 44, and that's the pavilion just there yeah. behind. So it would have been in use then. Yeah, yeah. And that's the terrace in behind that yeah. you talk about. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that anybody Yeah. What an honour. Here we go. You, you'll see why. Wow. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Wow. Some of the shirts in here. Right. Any you can explain? Okay. We've got a. Celtic goalkeeper shirt there. Yeah, well, Connor Hazard, he's out and loan from Celtic at the, at the minute. He was okay. a football player. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's went, was transferred to Celtic. We've got a Motherwell in behind there. Yeah. Donnelly, yeah. Gormley. That was his um, St. Johnson shirt. That's St. Johnson? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So that's Joe Gormley, our uh, record goal scorer. So your kit man has been given these he down the years. Over oh, the years. Wow. He's gathered them all up. These are incredible. Norwood there. Yeah. What shirt is this from his time at Sheffield United, I take? Oh, it says Blades. Blades so, yeah. yeah. McNair. McNair, yeah. Paddy McNair, yeah. yeah. Wambasaka, Zuma, Pulisic, Mendy. What's the Chelsea connection here, then? Uh, not entirely sure. Brian just has a knack of... <laughs> Picking up shirts from somewhere. Brian's Fabian Cher as well.
Brian Campbell's the kit man. Kit manager, yeah. And I bet the club probably couldn't run without people like him, right? Brian's another volunteer at the club. You know, yeah. working non-stop tirelessly. For yeah, the club. and it looks great in here. I mean, look at all these bags. I'm sure he's, like, on top of everything and... Yeah, with this is he's already you know we play, played last night. Always we played in our way kit, but he's already preparing for a home kit for yep. a game on Saturday. You know. So that's John McAlery, the man who brought football to Ireland after yet they go the honeymoon. He said. So the first competition, the Irish Cup, started in 1880. But you were also founder members of the league. Is that right as well? Yeah. Well, you know, we we we, we constituted the uh, the IFA, the Irish Football Association. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, the the, the league, and we're. You know, uh, instrumental in starting so many different things. Like there's the regional associations called the County Antrim Football Association, um, and that we were instrumental in. The and so that. I've made videos at Queens Park before. Mm -hmm. They weren't just Scotland's. They're not just Scotland's oldest club. They gave their entire squad for Scotland's first international game. Yeah. Heavily linked with the SFA, old competitions like the Scottish Cup. You seem like you're very much the Queens Park of Ireland. If you don't. Yeah, Mind yeah, me yeah, yeah, so. yeah, no, in a lot of ways we are, and uh, it was nice to actually rekindle that story because in, in the summer we played Queen's Park yeah. in the uh, oh, SPFL the Trust Trof Trophy, the Trust Trophy, Scottish yeah. Challenge Cup. Yeah. Yes, we, play, we we played them. We had had played them a hundred and whatever years beforehand in a, in a friendly match yep. here at Solitude, and but it was good to renew that. So was there a bit of a meeting then before the game between, obviously, delegates from both clubs to sort of meet and exchange gifts in oh, what was yes. a historic game? Yes, it? yes, there, there, there was. That, yeah. that, that sort of thing happens. We are a member, Cliftonville are a member of the what's called the Club of Pioneers. Mm -hmm. Queen's Park is the founders of football in Scotland. It was something that was started by Sheffield in England, yes. the original club, and it, it, it grew that they would, the, this Club of Pioneers went round to every club and it's growing across the world. Yeah, in Europe, yeah, I've seen that there's clubs, the oldest club from every country, there's like a, yes. a connection between you all. That's right, yes. yeah, I have seen and that before. They formed this association of the Club of Pioneers, you know, yep. so it's quite a wee, a wee story. You know? Cliftonville, the premier club, refused to follow the money route and stayed honestly amateur. Yep. Again, like Queen's Park, yep. they did that for a number of decades as well. And yep. they, they changed in 2019 to become... We did it earlier, we were you in the 70s. 72, 73. Okay. And did that really sort of propel the club forward from? That it's slow, you know, it didn't. There wasn't an immediate impact, but slowly but surely the club started. You know, we were the Cinderella club, finishing bottom of the league year on year. There was no relegation. Yeah. So you know, we had to be re-elected into the league every year, and so yep. it went on. You know. So Champions League against Celtic in twenty, what was that? Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Oh wow! So that's here at Solitude, a Champions League qualifier. Yeah. Any Celtic players there that recognise Fraser Forster in goal? By the looks of things. Scott Brown, captain, I think. He's turning away there. And then here's your boys at Celtic, Celtic Park. Park as well. Yeah. That's like Scott Brown, yeah. Effie Ambrose, I want to say. Uh, Forrest, maybe. Samaras as well. Yeah, Samaras, he also played at Solitude too. So we're just on the other side of the ground. The Cuttonville Roads up there, our original ground, yep. is on the other side. And this is Solitude here. But this whole area, right from the cricket club where we at the, where I showed you where we were at the beginning through Solitude here, all this land was named after a house that actually stood just where the water is here. Um, and the house was called Solitude. And it was a singular house, right? So one house and all around here the land was called Solitude. Yeah. Because in those days, back in the 1830s, this Belfast wasn't a city, it was a town. Mm -hmm. But it was growing rapidly and eventually the house was sold and the la this land here was acquired by the Belfast Water Company to create a reservoir uh, to service Belfast water needs. So that, that was created back in the, in the 1830s. Later on then we acquired this land, still known as Solitude, where there was no houses, no population around at all when the football ground started. And obviously because of it being by itself. Yep. Being what a great Solitude. name as well, I think. For all the stadiums that I've been to around the world, this is a name of one that really sort of stands out in my mind, Solitude. There's not many that have such yeah. epic names like that, yeah, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. So people have talked about, oh, could we do a commercial thing, get you know, sponsors on the ground, name and over. You can't do that to Solitude. It's like doing Anfield or Old Trafford or something. You can't yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, you just can't do it. As you can see, I am now back in Scotland. What a great trip to Belfast that was. Really enjoyed the three games that I went to at the home of Linfield, Crusaders and Glentoran, the shirt I have behind me. 
and um, the stadium tour that you're watching just now, the Cliftonville tour. There's many facts that I couldn't even fit into this video as it is right now, um, such as the fact that they played in the FA Cup in England, and such as the fact that the stand behind the goal, um, the one that said Reds on it when I was interviewing David, actually is named after the founder of the club as well. So there's way more facts I barely even got into. This is like a 20 odd minute video and I've just basically scratched the surface of the amazing history of this old club. Have a little look into it yourself, look on the club website, look online, find some articles, find some things. It's absolutely fascinating. If you ever get the chance, go over there, go for a game and really get a feel for what the club is all about. I would hugely recommend that you go and watch football in Northern Ireland. While it's probably overlooked in terms of UK football, obviously with the Premier League and then even Scotland and potentially Wales in a, in a lot of aspects, um, I feel like it is largely forgotten about. There's Windsor Park, there's Linfield, there's Glentor and the Oval, there's Crusaders, there's Cliftonville. That's just in Belfast. There's more outside of Belfast. Larn, who are top of the league as well, who we've not even barely spoke about in these four videos that I did this time around. So yeah, do make sure you check out my other Northern Ireland videos I've made in the past as well. Had an absolute blast filming them. I'll be back over very soon, I hope. There's some big, big games coming up over there. And I've had a lot of people ask me about League of Ireland games as well. So like the Republic of Ireland and their football system. Um, it's really handy that they have a summer season. So when it's pre-season over here and there's not a lot going on, I'll go over to Ireland. I did that last year and I'll be doing that again this year too. So I may even go over before the season finishes in the UK. So um, yeah, look out for when I do come over. Uh, there's some great teams over there. Cork obviously promoted this year. Shamrock Rovers, the champions, haven't had a great start to things. So maybe there'll be a new champion. Um, the European qualifiers, when they come up in the summer, it's just going to be amazing as well. Went to one last year at Derry City. So yeah, more Irish and um, Northern Irish content, League of Ireland, FAI, all that stuff to come um, in the future, I'm sure. So please make sure you subscribe. I'll leave two match day vlogs on screen um, for when I was just recently over in Belfast. Please do check them out. Honestly, I had such a great time filming them. Some really cool people over there. Thank you everyone for being so accommodating to me over there. Thanks and I'll see you in the next one.